Now, even most awful movies aren't entirely worthless. I mean, there's usually something that can be praised, be it a decent performance, cool sliver of dialogue, or an idea that might have worked better with a different approach. And then there are those terrible films that manage to deliver a single thrilling action sequence amid a sea of otherwise atrocious filmmaking choices. And that's what we're here to talk about today. As I'm Jules, this is WhatCulture.com, and these are 10 incredible action scenes in terrible movies. Number 10. The Forest Fight Transformers Revenge of the Fallen The second Transformers film might well be the most unbearable of the lot, a cluster migraine masquerading as a movie that is jam-packed with humour both embarrassing and offensive, plus way too much talking and not nearly enough compelling action. The single saving grace, though, comes at almost exactly the one-hour mark, where Optimus Prime battles the combined might of Autobots Megatron, Starscream, and Grinder. The thrillingly kinetic fight kicks off in a gorgeous remote forest, and as presented in a full frame IMAX aspect ratio delivers action with scale and clarity far in excess of anything else in the movie. The visual effects hold up incredibly well to this very day, offering up a real sense of weight to the dueling bots and palpable fear that Optimus will not come out on top this time, and eventually he doesn't. It's a sequence that proves what brilliance Michael Bay is capable of when the conditions are right, even if it's miserably plonked into the middle of an otherwise mind-numbingly awful movie. Number 9. Bond vs North Korea – Die Another Day Die Another Day sadly brought Pierce Brosnan's hit-and-miss tenure as 007 to an unceremoniously woeful end, overindulging in silly action, corny one-liners, and an inane plot to the point that it basically became a parody of itself. It's especially disappointing, as the film's pre-title sequence promises a considerably better and more seriously-minded movie, with James Bond facing off against a rogue North Korean army colonel and his seemingly never-ending fleet of goons. The sequence shows Bond outnumbered in a way that we've rarely seen before, forced to combine tech gadgets with his scrappy cunning to blow up the base, hijack a hovercraft, and start chasing the colonel. It is a scene packed with ludicrously, explosively entertaining action beats, most of which is achieved practically in stark contrast to the rest of the movie, before climaxing with a rather unexpected result, and that is Bond being captured. And when you start your movie with Bond outmaneuvering a giant flamethrower and using an Uzi to detonate mines whilst piloting a hovercraft no less, you better have something insane ready to follow up with. Sadly, Die Another Day didn't, and once Madonna's title track starts up, it goes pretty much downhill. Number 8. Taking Out the Trash – Death Wish 3 by any standard metric of evaluating a film, Death Wish 3 is totally awful, a textbook example of a franchise entering its shambling, zombified stage as it continues to exist only because the box office grosses haven't dried up yet. On a moral level, the reactionary right-wing politics are so disgustingly on the nose as to be unintentionally comical, enough that the film has become something of an accidental, campy cult classic in recent years. But ironic enjoyment aside, there is one sequence in the movie that is utterly unimpeachable as action film filmmaking goes. And that's the gonzo climax in which Charles Bronson's pull rallies the citizens of an overrun New York City to violently fight back against the creeps that are haranguing them. What follows is a glorious 15-minute orgy of cartoonish violence, beginning with Paul unleashing an oversized minigun on the street punks and only getting more absurd from there. After finally running out of ammo, Paul reverts back to his trusty hand cannon to keep mowing the bad guys down, intercut with the area increasingly coming to resemble an actual war zone as the punks blow up basically every building and vehicle in sight. It is an absolute bloodbath, with cops, criminals, and civilians all suffering massive casualties, until the sequence concludes with its pièce de résistance, and that is Paul blowing up the gang's leader, Manny, with a bloody bazooka. Number 7. The Cliffside Ninja Fight – G.I. Joe Retaliation Though G.I. Joe Retaliation was a tad more tolerable than its pure jank predecessor, primarily due to the presences of both Dwayne Johnson and Bruce Willis, it was still ultimately a bland nothing burger of a sequel that made no impact whatsoever. Yet there is a single scene that people still fondly remember a whole decade later, and that is the wonderfully thrilling cliffside ninja fight in which Snake Eyes and Jinx join forces to battle an unrelenting fleet of ninjas whilst carrying an injured Storm Shadow up a cliff. In terms of action design, it is both imaginative and technically impressive impressive, focusing on the perilous, breathless thrill of heroes sprinting across a cliff face with swords while cutting their way through a ninja horde. It's a scene that feels more in tune with a kid playing with their G.I. Joe action figures than anything else in the series' three movies, and it's really the only truly worthwhile sequence in the entire bloody trilogy. Number 6. The Single Take Shootout – London Has Fallen 
While Olympus Has Fallen, the first entry into Gerard Butler's dad thriller series, was a solid slice of B-movie fun, sequel London Has Fallen touted a much meaner and more misanthropic streak, as ultimately descended into outright xenophobia. But amid its ugly America is the best vibe, there is one set piece that cannot be discounted, and that is the superbly slick single-take shootout in which Secret Service agent Mike Banning battles his way through the streets to save kidnapped US President Benjamin Asher. Alongside a Delta slash SAS extraction, team, Banning gingerly pushes forward through the streets, mowing down dozens of anonymous goons in a single seamless take. Even though the digital joins between the takes are incredibly obvious, it's clear that a ton of effort went into staging the sequence to be as immersive as possible, and it positively shames the resoundingly pedestrian action thriller that the rest of the film becomes. For around five pulse-racing minutes, it almost convinced us that London Has Fallen might be a good movie. Number 5. The Fake Out Finale – The Twilight Saga Breaking Dawn Part 2 Twilight's final entry, Breaking Dawn Part 2, is an appropriately awful conclusion to a series that never quite found a fun balance of frothy teen melodrama and campy thrills. The second part of this two-part conclusion is, for the most part, a leaden bore, packed with unintentionally cackle-worthy dialogue and drama, but that is saved for a climactic showdown that is far better than the movie really deserves. Because the Breaking Dawn novel ends on something of an uncinematic shoulder shrug, the filmmakers smartly came up with something new that ultimately wouldn't actually piss off the die-hard fans, and so part two wraps up with a wonderfully bonkers battle as the vampires and wolves team up to fight the villains. For a PG-13 movie aimed at tweens, it's a shockingly violent war, with cherished characters being dismembered and even decapitated before our very eyes, though the vampire's ice-like composition makes the brutality a little more palatable for families. Fans were surely irate that characters who survived in the book were dying left and right until the fight suddenly ends and we realise that it was actually just a vision being shown to the leader of the villains by Alice which convinces him to walk away, and that's that. Make no mistake, Breaking Dawn Part 2 utterly stinks, but the filmmakers did the absolute best they could with a tricky situation, delivering a smart, surprisingly visceral compromise to the source material's non-ending. Number 4. The First Person Shooting – Doom 2005's Doom might be the better of the two live-action Doom movies produced to date, the other being 2018's wretched director video Doom Annihilation, but it is still a load of old bobbins for the most part. For starters, the hell setting from the video games was ditched for no discernible reason, and the bulk of the movie smacks of a generic sci-fi action romp with recognisable branding cynically just slapped over it. But there is a single sequence that captures the honest-to-god vibe of the video games, and that's when protagonist John Reaper Grimm is injected with a life-saving experimental serum bestowing him with superhuman abilities as he takes on the monster's gallery filling the UAC research facility. And the scene's big hook is that it's executed from a first-person perspective as a single take in order to resemble the aesthetic of the games. It's goofy, for sure, but it boasts a creativity and technical ingenuity that suggests a real love for the source material, something that the script otherwise totally lacks. Seeing Reaper blast his way through infected humans and mutated monsters alike, including the monstrous Pinky, is a ton of fun, even if it's a sadly fleeting diversion in an otherwise piss-poor adaptation. Number 3. Doom's Rampage – Fantastic Four 2015 from one doom to another now, with Josh Trank's ill-fated 2015 Fantastic Four reboot. Now, depending on who you believe, the film was either hacked to pieces by a twitchy fox, or Trank simply couldn't hack it as a big-budget filmmaker, but either way, the end result is a chaotic, tonally jarring mess that unfortunately totally fell flat. But there is one scene which hints at the film's darker potential, given that Trank has spoken extensively about his movie being inspired by the body horror films of David Cronenberg. And that comes near the end, where Doom is awakened and embarks on a brutal rampage through the research facility where he's being held, Q Doom using his abilities to telepathically explode the heads of anybody who tries to prevent his escape. If you can get over Doom's undeniably silly design, it's a genuinely unnerving sequence which ranks among the more disturbing set pieces of any superhero film from the last decade. It may only last all of a hot minute, but what a minute. Number 2. The Chicago Chase – Jupiter Ascending Jupiter Ascending is one of the biggest mega-budget disappointments of the last decade, an ambitious dud from the Wachowskis that, despite its technical ingenuity, abjectly failed on a narrative and character level. And let's not even get started on Eddie Redmayne's Razzie-winning performance here. But there's one set piece so masterfully executed as to be worthy of The Matrix, and that's the eight-minute chase sequence in which Jupiter and Kane flee from an alien fleet in downtown Chicago. As the aliens attack, Kane scoops up a falling Jupiter with his rather nifty anti-gravity boots, soaring across the Chicago 
Fargo skyline whilst alien weaponry decimates nearby skyscrapers. There's an incredible visual clarity to the sequence, despite its frantic intensity, enough so that we can fairly assume a good portion of the film's stonking $200 million budget was spent on it. As a dazzling VFX showcase and a reminder of what the Wachowskis are capable of, it's a wonderful sequence. Yet coming so early in the first act as it does, it leaves the rest of the movie scrambling and failing to live up to it. And number one, the attack on Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor. Michael Bay strikes again, this time around with his flaccid attempt to out Titanic Titanic in his 2001 war epic Pearl Harbor. Clocking in as an excruciatingly overcooked 183 minutes, the late great Roger Ebert might have put it best when he said of the movie, Pearl Harbor is a two hour movie squeezed into three hours, about how on December the 7th, 1941, the Japanese staged a surprise attack on an American love triangle. Its centerpiece is 40 minutes of redundant special effects surrounded by a love story of stunning banana. And you know what, he's mostly right. The overwhelming bulk of Bay's film focuses on a toe-curlingly feckless love triangle between three characters you're barely encouraged to care about, and is set against the backdrop of a major piece of real-world history. Viewers have to sit through 90 minutes of exhausting melodrama before the attack on Pearl Harbor finally happens, but when it does, it at least has the courtesy to be a damn doozy. Even Bay's toughest attractors will struggle to write this technically stunning sequence off in its entirety. A staggering 30-minute pyrotechnics display can combining incredible practical stunt work and gorgeous VFX carnage. It's the only part of the movie that feels even remotely worthy of holding James Cameron's jockstrap, as soon enough we're back to business as tedious usual for the remaining hour. The attack on Pearl Harbor was so thoroughly ripe for a splashy Hollywood treatment, but Bay suffocated the centerpiece amid a wealth of gooey, unconvincing romance. And there we go, my friends. Those were 10 incredible action scenes in terrible movies. I hope that you enjoyed that, and let me know what you thought about it down in the comment section below. As always, I've been Jules. You can go follow me over on Instagram, where it's at RetroJ, but the O is a zero. And you can come check out all the Warhammer miniatures that I've been painting. Yes, I am a nerd. But before I go, I just want to say one thing. Hope you're treating yourself well, my friend, with love and respect, because you deserve all the best things in life, all right? As always, I've been Jules. You have been awesome. Never forget that. And I'll speak to you soon. Bye.